When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. Friends, would you please join me in a spirit of prayer? Holy and loving God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts may be forever acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So friends, the book of Acts tells us about the earliest days of the Christian church. At this point in the biblical story, Jesus has already been crucified, already been resurrected, and already ascended to heaven. Meaning, of course, that he is no longer around in bodily. The continued work of building up the kingdom of God, the, the continued work of spreading the gospel, is now entirely on the shoulders of Jesus' followers. The majority of the book of Acts is dedicated to telling us specifically about the efforts of the Apostle Paul to this end. And sure enough, in today's reading from Acts chapter 17, we see the Apostle Paul arriving in the Roman city of Thessalonica to spread the gospel. Thessalonica was located along the major trade route to the east, and it had been the most important port in the region for some three centuries. Because of this geography, Thessalonica was a diverse and a thriving city boasting a population of some 200,000 people. It was a happening place to be in the ancient world. So the Apostle Paul, he, he, he arrives in the, this happening city. But Paul being Paul, he doesn't check out Thessalonica's amazing restaurants, its amazing shops, sort of landmarks. No, no, that's not Paul's style. Paul, you see, he is single-minded. He is laser-focused. He is on a literal mission here, after all. And so he does the same thing that he does in every new city that he arrives in. He goes straight to the local synagogue and he starts preaching. And for three whole days, our boy Paul preaches and he preaches and he preaches in that synagogue. As for the content of his preaching, well, apropos of his personality, it is direct and to the point. There is no embellishment with Paul. 
He simply walks his audience through the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, arguing that these scriptures all point to the crucified and risen Jesus as being the true Messiah. And Paul's message, well, it lands with his audience in a big way. We're told that some Jews, a large number of Greeks, and quite a few prominent women were persuaded by his arguments and became Christians. Now, it needs to be pointed out that if today's story ended just there, we probably wouldn't be reading it because, I mean, meh, right? Nothing really has happened. There is no really big plot points here. The heart of this story, the most important part for us, at least, is in what happens next. So Paul ha has been preaching for three days, and nothing that he has said has been controversial by our standards. It's a fairly straightforward presentation of classic Christian doctrine. Oh, but boy, oh boy, is there a backlash in that synagogue. Out of a sense of jealousy, says the text, presumably jealousy over the excitement that this new faith has roused in its latest converts. Some of the Jews in the synagogue, who did not find Paul's preaching quite so compelling, uh, they went to the marketplace, they found some unemployed day laborers, and they stirred up an angry mob. This mob then goes looking for Paul at the house in the city where he's been staying. But when they get there, they don't find him. So they instead grab the house's owner, a man by the name of Jason, along with several other of the newly minted Christians. And this mob literally drags these people before the city officials. And the charges this mob levels against Paul and against Jason and against these new Christians, I gotta say, they are unintentionally complimentary. The mob cries out that they say, these men, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason, well, I mean, he welcomed them into his house, and they're all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, a king named Jesus. Just to summarize here, the, the accusations being leveled are threefold. Number one, the mob is saying that, that Paul and Jason and the other Christians are actively and effectively changing the world. They're turning it upside down, is the accusation. Number two, they're being accused of practicing hospitality. Jason welcomed Paul into his house. And number three, they're being accused of declaring that their only allegiance is to the love of God, that is to, to Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but, but go ahead and accuse me of those things. I be proud. By our standards, there is nothing controversial in these accusations whatsoever. And in fact, they sound more like a straightforward description of what it means to be a Christian in the first place. That is exactly why we need to pay attention to how the crowd responds, how the city officials respond when they hear this. When they heard this, the text says, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Or as other translations put it, the crowd and the city officials were disturbed, agitated, stirred up, troubled. So what we're seeing here in this moment in the text is that there is something about this new faith. There is something about Christianity in its most basic form. There seems to be something intrinsic to it that brings its followers into tension, not necessarily conflict, but into tension with public officials and with anyone really who is comfortable with the world as it is. In fact, this was one of the major critiques made by the earliest detractors of the faith. The Roman historian Suetonius, for instance, described Christians as a class of people of a new and a damaging superstition. This tension is part and parcel of our faith and has been from the very beginning. And it still is today. Now, some of you already know this. I've mentioned it during prayer time over the past few weeks. Uh, but since the COVID outbreaks, folks in the homeless community in the greater Boston area have been hit harder than most. And everybody, it needs to be said, has been hit pretty hard. 
With businesses and churches and shelters shut down, access to the everyday stuff of life has become scarce. I'm talking food, water, showers, toilets. Uh, so just for, for example, up until this past week, there have been just three public toilets. And when I say toilets, I mean literal toilet bowls. There have been three public toilets available for use to folks living in the streets of Cambridge. Now, my household only has one bathroom, and thanks to all of you who prayed me through its renovation last year, uh, my marriage just barely survived that fiasco. I mean, even with just me and my wife in the house, at times it feels like one bathroom is not enough. And in Cambridge, there are about 150 homeless folks on the street right now who had to share with those just three toilets. You do the math because it ain't pretty. And while the city of Cambridge has certainly done some good work to respond to these needs, uh, they've opened up a shelter at the Ringgen Latin High School to enable homeless folks to socially isolate. They've partnered with restaurants to provide nightly meals uh, for folks living on the street. Uh, while they've done all of this, there is still a lot of work that remains to be done. And honestly, they haven't been all that quick to do it. So, uh, the Outdoor Church, along with an organization called the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, we got together a group of 20 churches and 36 nonprofits, and we wrote a letter to the city manager, the guy who holds the purse strings to the city of Cambridge's $678 million budget. And in that letter, we outlined the needs we were seeing on the ground, and we proposed solutions to those problems. We likewise expressed our willingness to partner with the city in order to make those solutions a reality. And right before we went to sit, hit that center, a lot of wavering started to take place in that little consortium of ours. There was worry that if we weren't nice enough, if we pushed too hard, if we created too much tension with the powers that be, this whole project might just blow up in our face. Fair enough. But interestingly, uh, and in light of today's passage, perhaps predictably, in that moment, it was one of the pastors in this group, and not, mind you, a representative of one of the rapidly leftist organizing advocacy groups uh, that had joined in our cause, uh, but it was one of the Christian pastors that stepped in to point out that, yeah, yeah, th there is considerable tension in this letter, in this moment. But we didn't seek it out. We didn't manufacture it. There's tension in this moment because we're bearing witness to the needless suffering of some of the most vulnerable people in our community. And the people with the money and the power to stop it, well, they have not yet done all they need to do. And that's why there's tension. And if we don't lean into it, if we're not willing to make some people uncomfortable, nothing's ever going. And that, that is what today's Bible story is about. It's not saying that Christians cause a ruckus for the sake of causing a ruckus. Rather, what it says is that we're a people who pledge our allegiance to love above all other things. And so, we're a people who recognize more than most that the world as it is, is not as it could be, is not as it should be. And if we're going to change this world for the better, if we're going to turn the world upside down like the Apostle Paul, well, that's going to cause some turmoil from time to time. We're, we're going to have to ruffle some feathers. And while I really wish I had a happy ending to tell you about that letter we sent, we're actually still in the, the middle of it, and we're expecting a reply early this week. I will let you know uh, how it all goes. Uh, but until then, friends, uh, may God bless us to this holy work of creating tension of creating turmoil, of ruffling feathers, all in the name of love. Amen.